And now for our first scripture reading, which we will do in unison, Hebrew 2, verses 10 through 18. On the screen. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings, for one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham's. Therefore, he had become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself was tested by what he suffered. He is able to help those who are being tested. The reading of the Lord. Use this, I guess, for the broadcast. Uh, You're kind of close. I actually have had three different children's sermons that I've been working on. And I really didn't like the first. And I kind of settled that I would do the second one. And then driving down, God kind of whispered in my ear and he said, I don't like either of those. So what we settled on, he and I, Happy New Year. That's what we say today, right? You're going to hear it a hundred times. Everybody in this room is going to say Happy New Year to you. I kind of feel that God prefers a different greeting. I think God would rather we say to one another, God's peace and joy be with you. Okay? God's peace and joy be with you be with you. And I I tell you why I think God prefers that. Happy. You can be happy because in school you got an A on a paper. You had an exam and you got a really good grade. You would be happy, right? Cool. Then you would go out on the playground, trip on a step, skin your knee and tear your pants, And that happiness would be gone. Happiness is fleeting. Happiness is just for now. Happiness is just for today. What I think God wishes for all of us is God's peace. God's peace, God's shalom, not only means that something bad won't happen to you today, But God's shalom, God's peace means that everything good that could possibly happen to you would happen today. Not only the absence of bad things, but all of the good things that God wants for you. And what that is, is God wants a personal relationship with each of us. God wants you to rely on God. And with that relationship, with that shalom, that that relationship with God comes joy. And joy is different from being happy. Joy lasts a lifetime. Because with God in your heart, with the relationship with God in your heart, you have an outpouring of joy that not only lasts this lifetime, but an everlasting lifetime. So my wish for 
James and Ben, and all of you, is instead of Happy New Year, which is only going to last today, I wish you God's shalom, God's peace and joy. May it be upon you all. Amen. Thank you, boys. The second scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. It's entitled, The Escape to Egypt. There's a lot more in there, in here, and please listen. Hear the word of God. Now, after they had left, they being the, the Magi, after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. And when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he became infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children, she refused to be consoled because they were no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he had heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in a place in place of his father Herod. He was afraid to go there. And after being warned again in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might again be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Over the years, I have come to realize something about the New Year and New Year's sermons. It is that I don't like pastors giving New Year's sermons about resolutions. To be honest with you, I just don't like the notion of making resolutions for the new year. I mean, I resolve in the new year that I'm going to make myself better by fill in the blank. And the reason for this is, quite frankly, because I'm horrible at keeping New Year's resolutions. And I prefer not to set myself up for failure in the coming year by falling flat on my face right at the start by breaking my resolutions right at the beginning of the new year. Diets. I never stay on a diet past the first piece of garlic bread in an Italian restaurant. I mean, there are certain things that should be sacrosanct and exempt from, from resolutions, like a piece of garlic bread and, and chicken parmesan and, and pasta in your favorite Italian restaurant. Not for Lent or for the new year. Exercise. I always say I'm going to exercise more, like, like walking in the neighborhood. But really? I mean, we live in North Jersey. And, and this week, notwithstanding, because I, I wrote this sermon during those days where the temperatures were below zero back in December before Christmas, so the whole notion of going out at the first of the year and walking around in North Jersey when it's the worst of winter's uh, weather, when it's, it's usually icy everywhere, 
you, you really just take your life in your hands, and, and I simply prefer not to. It's not safe. So you've got to wait for nicer weather to come along, and in North Jersey, that's usually May. And by May, I've totally forgotten what I've resolved to do. Gym membership, you say? I've never renewed a gym membership past Valentine's Day. That's my limit. So all in all, it's safe to acknowledge that I'm not a resolutions type person. So take a deep breath and relax and let out a sigh of relief because I'm not going to talk to you today about resolutions for the new year. And later on, you won't have to politely come up to me and say you enjoyed my message about making resolutions for the new year. Ain't going to happen. Not going to go there. So what do we have for today? Well, Pastor Robin told me, whoa, right up front, don't go near the Magi. She's already got that set up for Epiphany. Don't steal that from me, Mel. So I look at the lectionary, and what do I have left? The slaughter of the innocents. What? Talk about getting the new year off to a bad start. So we're not going there either. No, today, thanks to an idea I got from reading the little devotion books uh, these days, perhaps you have them around your sanctuary, I decided I'd like to talk to you about this man, Joseph. You know, Joseph from the line of David, the earthly father of Jesus. I want to take a closer look at this man. We don't hear much about him in the early Gospels, and, and we don't know much about him more than what we hear in legends as they fill in for us. So let me start by saying Joseph, for me, has always been kind of a one-hit wonder. He comes on the scene early in the Gospel story, rises right up to the top ten hits list for the week, and then quickly disappears in a flash and fades from the stage. It's kind of like Casey Kasem's top ten oldies, one-hit wonders for the year. We reprise his one-hit, Joseph, this time of the year, every year. And then he fades. The first we hear about Joseph is in Matthew's account of the genealogy of Jesus. In chapter 1, verse 16, we're told that G Joseph is a direct descendant of the King David. And Matthew painstakingly details all the generations from Joseph back to David because that is critical in the narrative and the prophecy of who the Messiah would be. So Matthew establishes Joseph's prophetic accreditation. What's the line in the movie, Brother, Where Art Thou? Joseph was bonafide. Then in the beginning of verse 18 of Matthew, we hear an account of the birth of Jesus. Now, we all know the story. Joseph is be betrothed to a young woman, Mary. But before their wedding, he finds out she's with child. Now, this man, Joseph, has a dilemma. He's devout. If he announces that he will divorce her, she will most likely be stoned to death. So this, this fellow decides he will quietly dismiss her. But what happens? In his sleep, an angel comes to him and reveals what God's plan is and what God requires him to do. And when Joseph awake, awakens, what does he do? Well, Matthew tells us, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. Joseph took Mary as his wife. Joseph's obedience is, is what I want to talk to you about today. Because we're going to see that Joseph's obedience to what God asks of him is critical to how God's plan of salvation and redemption is played out. If Joseph refuses and turns Mary out, then God has to call an audible and go to plan B. 
So I want you to think of how Joseph's obedience each time he is mentioned in the gospel develops and moves God's plan forward. After the birth narrative, the next time we hear Joseph mentioned by Matthew is after the Magi had visited and left Bethlehem. We are told that in his sleep once again, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and tells him, get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there till I tell you. Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Again, what does Joseph do? In the next verse, we read, then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night and went to Egypt. Joseph didn't even wait for morning. In the dead of night, Joseph stirs his family, collects their belongings, and moves them out and onto the road to Egypt. Whatever safeties and comforts they thought they had in Bethlehem were now gone and left behind. The next we hear of Joseph is in verse 19, after the death of Herod. An angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life are dead. And after the dream, again, what does Joseph do? In verse 21, Matthew tells us, Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. We hear of Joseph one more time, and that's when he's warned in a dream to stay away from Judea. So he goes to the district of Galilee. All of these verses, we never hear of Joseph by name again. Legend fills in the story and tells us he was a hardworking carpenter who taught his eldest son Jesus his trade. But after, but we actually have no biblical verses that really tell us more about the man. We do have a story of Jesus in the temple when his parents lose track of him on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And then they return to find him in the temple. And then they return to Nazareth. But it is Mary, we are told, that keeps all these things in her heart. At the end, Joseph isn't even mentioned. So there's not a whole lot about Joseph if if you measure it by the number of verses that mention him by name. But yet... There are some important lessons we can learn from this unique man of God if we take the time to look. So the first thing we can see is that Joseph had some pretty vivid dreams, amazing dreams. It seems that, at least in the verses that mention him, he lays down to sleep and he dreams of angels. He dreams of messengers and messages from God. This is a special person. Not only did he desire to follow God's commands while he is awake, but literally dreams of them while he is asleep. Joseph sleeps and is told not to abandon Mary, to take her as his wife and the child as his own. Joseph sleeps and is told to get up and flee to Egypt. Joseph sleeps and is told to return to Israel. Joseph sleeps and is told not to go to Judea, but to go to Galilee. Each of these dream sequences of angel messengers from God are turning points in the narrative of the birth and early life of the Messiah. All of them hinge on one critical thing that is never spoken of outright. And it passes by us quickly if we don't take notice. What I'm referring to is Joseph's immediate obedience to the messengers and to God's commands. Joseph's response is never to question or debate with God, a la his ancestors of the faith and how Israel always reacted and interacted with God. No, Joseph's response was always immediate obedience. 
If you look back on the patriarchs of our Old Testament stories, you will find constant hesitation and questioning of God's plan. Abram questions God's promise of descendants. He says to God, you show me the stars, but in my house, my, dis- my, my heir will be a slave. Moses questions whether he is the right choice to speak with Pharaoh. He says, choose Aaron. I stutter. Let him speak to Pharaoh. Jacob's name is actually changed to Israel. Israel means to wrestle with God. Constantly, throughout the books of the prophets, we hear how Israel makes choices other than what God has asked them to do. Isaiah tells Ahaz not to align with the Assyrians, but he does anyway. And it leads to the downfall and captivity of Judah, but not Joseph. Joseph is told to take Mary as his wife, and he does. Joseph is told to take the child and mother to Egypt, and he does. But when does he do it? He got up in the middle of the night. He did not even wait for the sun, for dawn. Joseph is told to get up and return to Israel, and he does it again immediately. There's no question. There's no debate. Could you imagine? Hey, God, now, wait a minute here. We got a good thing going here in Egypt. I got my carpentry shop shop up and running. I got several regular clients who depend on me. Good income. I just got Entrepreneur of the Year from the Jewish Businessmen's Association. Good neighborhood, good schools, family is growing, things are sweet in Egypt. Why do we have to leave? No, there's none of that. After each message, Joseph gets up and does what he's told. Joseph is obedient without question, and that is something we can learn from this man. There is less attention paid to Joseph than in the Beatitudes, less attention than the prodigal father story. Even the lepers lepers, get more newsprint in the Gospels than Joseph. Now you're going to say, hey, Mel, the Beatitudes, come on. They're the core of Jesus' teaching. Luke 15 is the greatest story told within the greatest story. Yeah, I know that. But here's the thing. There's one critical thing we can learn from Joseph, and that one critical thing is obedience to God. This man, Joseph, isn't acknowledged as having played a major role in God's plan to bring shalom, God's peace, to the world. But without his obedience, Mary may have been stoned to death instead of giving birth to the Messiah. Without his immediate action, when told to get up, the child may have remained in jeopardy in Bethlehem. He may never have returned from Egypt. He might have wind up in Judea, where where Herod's irrational and murderous son was still in power. No. Each time Joseph got up and did exactly what he was asked to do by God. In our text, it says he did it as he was commanded by God. But my sense is that when a man like Joseph has made a place in his heart for God, a command doesn't have a harsh connotation like like what we give it today. For Joseph, a command from God was like, being asked something to do something you would do without hesitation anyway. I think in this sense, the use of the word command actually displays the awesome power of God in the heart of a man who loves God. So my friends, in this way, this is my New Year's resolution message for you. Make a resolution to create a place in your hearts 
the way Joseph did. He was a poor, he was a man poor in spirit who hungered and who thirsted to have a relationship with God. He was a man who celebrated with utter joy the knowledge that God was there. So much so that obedience was simply an outpouring of his joy. My friends, make a place in your hearts where you hunger and thirst for God to be. Make a place where obedience is an outpouring of your joy.